Alrighty, if you're playing Ascension for the first time physically, um, each player gets the same starting hand of cards. You get eight apprentices and two militia. Then you're going to shuffle those up and place them in into a personal deck pile. So at the start of your game, your deck pile will have ten cards in it. Then you will shuffle up the center deck, which has a hundred cards in the base set. Uh, that varies a little bit between set to set, but you're going to shuffle all of those up and place the center pile down. Now, don't flip anything out to the center row yet. Your opponent will do the same thing with their deck. Then you will place the Mystics, Heavies, and Cultists in their ever-ready spots on the board, because those are always purchasable as independent stacks. Note that the Cultists if killed for two power and getting the one reward does not go to the void. The cultist is always available to be killed. So that's the only little weird difference. That's why there's only one of that card. It gets killed repeatedly as many times as you need. Cultist is always available. Okay, now that you have that set up, you need to pick the first player. Just do so randomly or however you want to pick. The game has equal numbers of turns. You need to remember who the last player is. On the digital version, it has this little um, white border showing that this is the second player and he will get the final turn. If I were to end the game, which we'll get to the end game condition in a bit, then he would get to play one more turn even though the game is already in its final state. Okay, once you know who the first player is, then you flip six cards from the center out into the center row. This becomes the buying, killing, shared pool for each player. Um, all deck builders have the same kind of general theme. You will start with the same things, very, very boring cards, but you're going to use those boring cards to purchase new cards and put them into your discard pile. Then every time you need to draw a card and you can't, you will shuffle your entire discard pile and start drawing from that, putting these new cards into play. Now on Ascension, the thing you need to know is there is a play area, a discard pile, a hand, and a deck. These four zones cannot be confused. Many times physically, people are tempted to play a card and put it into their discard pile because they've used it, or they'll spend money. Now that they've spent money, they put that apprentice that's been used in their discard pile to show that they don't have it left. That is not okay, because if you were to play a draw a card effect, you do not shuffle that apprentice into your deck. You only shuffle the cards currently in your discard pile. There are several other effects as well, such as banishes, that allow you to banish something in the discard pile. And uh, your play area is not the discard pile. You can only banish something specifically where it tells you to. Typically it tells you hand or discard. So you can choose not to play something that could give you a benefit this turn and instead banish it but never get its effect. Or you can banish from your discard pile, but not your play area. The only exception is if Gift of the Elements comes out, you'll be able to start doing some cool things there with a special keyword. If that comes much later, you'll, it'll explain itself then too. So anyway, in a deck builder, you have these rooms for Ascension. These little triangle plus ones are runes. These are purchasing power. You'll see all the cards in the center have some triangle runes cost in their top right corner. That's what it costs for you to draft that card. So if I wanted to draft this Temple Librarian, I have to have two runes in my supply. The digital app keeps nice count of what you have remaining so that once I've spent it, I'm not confused as to how much I have left. Um, other things in here are monsters. Monsters do not go into your deck when defeated. If you get enough power, which comes from cards like the Militia, to defeat them, they will go to the Void. The Void is essentially a discard pile for everything that's come out of play that's not a starter card. When you banish a card from your deck, if it's a starter card, it goes into a Super Void, back into the box. But if you banish a card that's one of the center row cards, it goes to the void instead. Same thing with things like this here, the fork pass. Banish a card in the center row. It's a powerful effect that helps you get rid of something you can't afford you think is powerful, or get rid of monsters if you're not trying to go for them. Whatever you think your opponent wants, 
Or if you just don't like something and you're hoping to get a better flip from the center row, anytime a card is purchased, defeated, or banished from the center row, it is replaced immediately off the top of the center deck. That happens before anything else except for the card's effect. If something says when acquired or whatever, those effects go off, then immediately the card is replaced. Then you start making choices. So a lot of cards that say things like then banish from the center row, you replace it first before that banish goes off. So there will be a sixth option to be able to banish from. There's a little bit of iffiness that goes on there. Um, now. That's how a turn goes. You play your stuff, you spend it on things, then you pass your turn and draw five new cards from your deck. Right now my deck has zero cards in it. Once I run out of cards to be able to draw from, my deck immediately shuffles and I draw five new ones. The game proceeds like this, allowing you to buy, sell, do things, acquire, whatever until the end of the match. I don't want to play this Temple Librarian just for an example here. So I have two cards left in deck. I can always check what they are if I want to count because it shows me my deck is eight apprentices and all this stuff and a militia. Well, I have not seen the other militia and I can only see seven apprentices. Three here, four here. So I have an apprentice and a militia left to draw. If I pass my turn and draw, there's my apprentice and my militia and then three new cards that used to be in my discard pile that are now in the deck. At the end of your turn, before you draw up, you do put all of your in-play cards into the discard. So just because something is in play, if you have not drawn during that turn, those will hit the discard pile before the next turn starts. Um, what else do you need to know about this game? All right, every card that you buy has some star on the bottom left. It has some value at the end of the game for having acquired it. You'll notice your starters have no value. That's one of the reasons they're nice to get rid of. The other nice reason to get rid of them and banish them is they do very little compared to other things. Mechanic constructs in particular, and a lot of constructs actually, have very high value compared to their cost. Mechana is always one for one on the cost of their constructs. So that's a very powerful card to have at the end of the game to kind of buy your victory. The other way to gain honor is by killing monsters, such as the cultists or things like this in the center. They always, or usually rather, have some honor star value. Those are the victory points that will be added at the end of the game. The honor pool is 30 per player in a third edition and on rule set. The app currently is using first edition rules for the base set. So if you have three players, it'll be 75. Four players, it'll be 90. Any other set except for the base set, those numbers will be 60, 90, 120, which is the standard what you should do in a physical game, even if you only have the base set and even if it's an old set. Use 30 honor per player to have a nice balanced experience with it. Um, some people like to physically play with an additional honor pool so that games go longer and have more big combos, um, but you kind of destroy some of the balance of the game where things like Void and in Lifebound get this early advantage and then lose late. Well, you don't want to completely invalidate some of the factions. That said, factions, let's talk a little bit about those. I don't need to keep playing to talk about these things. I'm going to go to the card gallery and set it to Chronicle of the Godslayer, just the base set. Enlightened cards are these blue ones. They typically have draw, kill monsters for free, banish from the center row, copy, take an additional turn. These kind of things are very traditional effects for Enlightened. Some sets have a little bit of variation on it, but mostly that's what Enlightened cards do. They work well with everything because most of them have draw effects. The Lifebound. Lifebound have things like acquiring heroes without paying their cost and stacking the deck with them. They have direct honor gain. They have some draw a card, not as much as Enlighten, but a few. They have some getting runes. They have more getting honor directly. Um, very occasionally, they also have things with Unites or whatever to get power or effects to allow you to buy um, or honor value. It's not super common. Where is the runic lycanthrope? There we go. This is the earliest example of a Unite effect, and it's special on this card only. 
If you have played another Lifebound Hero this turn, gain two power. This card has to be played second. And all the other sets, when you see Unite... Let me just switch it to Storm. I know this has Unites. There you go. Unite is a new keyword that they introduced primarily for Lifebound, not exclusively, but primarily for Lifebound, to gain a bonus effect if you play two Lifebound heroes in the same turn. It does not matter the order you play them if it has the actual Unite keyword. You just have to have done them in the same turn and all of them will Unite. Now I have to flip back to the base set again. All right. Mechana. Mechana have some power, some runes, they do a little bit of both, but mostly they're all about constructs. The constructs, like I said before, are one-to-one -one honor value at the end of the game, and a construct, I guess I've never defined what that means, unlike a hero where you play it and then it goes to the discard pile at the end of the turn, a construct will go into play in front of you and stay there for the rest of the game unless destroyed by a monster effect or some other card. Um, your opponents can sometimes get rid of your constructs. You can try to defend against that by getting to those monsters first a lot of times. But these things just stay in front of you and do big things. Mechana are all about having lots of constructs to do things. Every faction has some constructs, but not nearly as many as Mechana. That's their main draw. Void cards, on the other hand, have this keyword, banish cards. Normally in your hand or discard pile, they help you thin out your deck, make it so you're drawing your best cards more frequently, getting rid of the trash that were originally in there and don't have value anyway. Void is all about the power. Almost everything has power. There are only a couple that have rune gain, and they typically have some other void effect on them as well. Um, bonuses for killing monsters. That's all void is about, is killing monsters. That's their thing. And then you have monsters. These are the things that never go into your deck unless otherwise specified. They have large honor value for their um, cost, and they often come with some bonus effect, like acquiring or defeating any other card in the center, getting rid of an opponent's construct, drawing cards, banish things in the center row, stealing a card from each opponent, which in a four-player game means you actually stole three cards. Things like this are very powerful. Monsters are a big part of the game. You can't ignore them completely and win. That said, you can, just it's really, really hard to. You'd have to be very construct heavy. Typically, you're going to do some monsters towards the end of the game, even if you went for a big buying deck. At some point, you'll buy some big void heroes or something to kill things. Uh, the only decks I've ever seen that win without actually doing that are things that have direct point gains through um, essentially lifebound cards. Now, I've only gone through the cards in the base set, you can go through each set individually. There are all kinds of cool things they do. Um, I will go ahead and mention, if I can find out where to go to it, um, all of the sets that they have. You've got Chronicle of the God Slayer, Return of the Fallen, Storm of Soul, Moral Hero, Rise of Vigil, Darkness Unleashed, Realms Unraveled, Dawn of Champions, Dreamscape, War of Shadows, Coming soon, Gift of the Elements. After that, you have Valley of the Ancients, and Delirium is releasing soon, June 15th at Origins. Lots of sets. This can be very overwhelming for a new player coming into it. If you just want to learn a deck builder because you've never played one before, the base set's a good way to learn a deck builder or bring a new player into this style of game. However, it offers very little flashy, it's not super special, it doesn't have the draw the rest of Ascension has. Realms Unraveled is my personal go-to for converting new people to Ascension. It has a huge amount of synergy focused on these cards are of the same type, they get bonuses. They kind of show off what each faction is all about. They have multi-faction, they have a thing called... Uh, transform, where if you can meet certain conditions, your heroes will upgrade and become even more powerful, also getting you a uh, bonus honor point at the end of the game for each card you transform. It's a very cool set. It has some of the most broken and large combos in the game. That's a turnoff to some people because they want every game to end with the honor or the total point value really close together. Well, that's great. I love a close game, too. But sometimes Realms Unraveled games were incredibly close. They came down to one move, 
that one move just allowed you to set off a 100 point combo or in some cases a 5000 point combo which is ridiculous. For the record, never uh, completely disregard what your opponent has. I have lost a game in Realms Unraveled with 450 points before. It's a huge score, and I still lost because my opponent did an even better combo. He actually was able to play off of the way I set up the center by having bought all the heroes. He was able to play off of having all the monsters only available. On that note, if you ever run out of cards in the center deck, you immediately take the void, however it is, and you shuffle it together and then flip it face back down and you have a new center deck to draw from. That happens the most I've noticed in four player games of the base set and in things where big big combos went off and someone or both players are doing huge things. Um, I would go over an overview of all of these. I'll just tell you Realms is my favorite. Dreamscape is my next favorite. It offers a cool little mechanism where you have cards exclusive to yourself. You pick at the beginning of the game from a few options and it kind of helps you keep an idea of what is my goal for this game right from the start and it offers some powerful things to you. Some people don't like that because maybe their Dreamscape offerings were worse than yours and they feel at a huge disadvantage the whole game. It's all just a matter of preference. You'll want to play a little bit of everything and see what you like. Storm of Souls and Immortal Heroes are two of the most loved sets. Storm of Souls is the most balanced set they've ever made in my opinion incredibly balanced between the factions and the play, always a satisfying experience. Immortal Heroes introduces soul gems. A lot of people don't like them because there's a lot of randomness. You get some card off of a special deck that gives you a benefit, and it might not be the benefit you want. You might have gotten one rune, and your opponent got draw three cards. Eh, Overall, it's a pretty balanced set. You're taking some risks if you're going for soul gems, or they're just a nice little bonus. I really enjoy that kind of play, but it can turn some people off. The ones that turn most people off are Rise of Vigil and Darkness Unleashed. These are the sets I highly recommend you do not play until you're a veteran and you've played almost everything else. The introduction of Treasure and Energize is a very complex strategy, and it offers a lot of depth to it. War of Shadows... Uh, well, not necessarily my favorite set, has one of the coolest mechanisms where every card is light or day and the board keeps constantly changing and shifting. It looks very pretty. It's got a lot of cool little draws to it. Uh, once it comes out, Gift of the Elements is one of the most high-powered, vicious kind of style of games that I've seen in Ascension, and they're always very satisfying to me. Um, Return of the Fallen is one of the other small sets. It doesn't add as many cards, but it adds a lot of monster-heavy stuff, direct honor gain. Um, that seems to be its main theme, even though everything is very representative. Some of the mechanic constructs in there are also very combo-y. Um, I particularly like that set myself. Do what you want with these, give them a try, but the base set, if you don't know deck building, if you do know deck building, try Realms Unraveled and see if the factions and the synergies are appealing to you. And then from there, you can go to your most stable, balanced Storm of Souls if that's what you want. Some of your biggest combos and fun things with Dreamscape if that's what you want. War of Shadows if you want a really cool, unique experience. Dawn of Champions I've sort of overlooked. Dawn of Champions is epic good and fun. It's got all kinds of crazy stuff going on, but it could be the most misbalanced set they've ever made for tournament play. There's a thing called Rally, where if you're lucky, you get cards for free. If you're really lucky, you get multiple cards for free. If you're insanely lucky, you just win the game and never did anything, or came back from a huge loss just to win in the end. Uh, not my favorite thing just because of that. I get kind of soured on losing games that I clearly had won, and they just luck-checked the win. But overall, it's still a very fun set to play. I would not discount it just because it's not balanced like Storm of Souls. Uh, I hope this has been helpful for you to learn how to play a deck builder, how to play Ascension, and kind of an idea of which sets to look at learning and playing. Have a wonderful time!